I want to show you what we cut up last year and talk a little bit about how I manufactured that stack because uh, before we get out of here today, some of the things that we've cut I want to put in a new stack to get you uh, uh, used to that as well. So let's go down here. And uh, <laughs> the, the rest of the stack we cut up with the wood miser last year. And if you look at the bottom, my bottom are wide boards of walnut. And I want to put my good stuff at the bottom because the more weight I have on that, the better chance I'll have to keep it flat and especially wider boards. You may notice that a lot of these wider boards have cracks in them and that's because they've been forced to sit flat, if that makes sense. Uh, the nice thing about it though, I, I of course haven't pulled this apart, a lot of times those cracks will stop at the first sticker. And the stickers are the, the little sticks that go in here to separate the, the boards so you can get air circulation. So usually it cracks at that first sticker or a little bit further in. So the further out towards the end you can get your stickers, the better. And you'll notice I have different thicknesses of wood mixed within the pile. Um, a lot of it was I kind of graded it as I went. So. I thought, okay, here's my really good stuff, here's my next good stuff, and it gets a little, I care a little bit less about it as it goes up, which means the stuff that you're always after is at the bottom of the pile. The, the big thing that I'd say uh, besides kind of layering it is you want to keep your cuts together. And what I mean by that is if I have a flats on board, like the, the first boards out of this log right here would be considered flat sawn because the grain of the wood is not parallel to the surface of the board, but you have a, a little bit of a, a crown there. Um, those are the most common boards that you're going to see. Then you get into stuff that's quarter sawn. And probably uh, my best example if you wanted to look at end grain for quarter sawn would actually be this guy, which is more rift than quarter, but the grain is running up and down on that. So for a flat sawn board, it's actually going to shrink more in width than it is in thickness. With a quarter sawn board, because the grain is the opposite direction, it's going to shrink more in thickness than it is in width. So if I start mixing in quarter sawn with flat sawn stock in this pile, I'm going to have places where you might have a board sh uh, quarter sawn board shrink down and you could grab that board and slide it right out on the end. So it has no support in there, it's just moving around. So that's part of what I'm doing too in these layers is I'm picking out uh, enough flat sawn boards that'll get me three feet wide, enough rift sawn boards that'll get me three feet wide, et cetera, et cetera. Usually within a row, I try to keep the same species of wood. Sometimes it doesn't work out, so you have to throw in a random. So up here, this started getting a little bit random. And you can see these boards up here, like this one, because there's not as much weight on it, started cupping a little bit more than the stuff that's being pushed flat down there. So. Um, you, if you look at the side of the stack, you're trying to keep the stickers all straight all the way down so you're uh, distributing weight uh, evenly. And just cutting lumber, I find that I go through a lot of eight quarter stock and thicker faster than you go through one inch boards. And if you think about it, if you run out of one inch boards, you can get one inch boards almost anywhere. But you get two inch boards, those are a little harder to come by. Three inch boards are impossible to come by. And four inch, you know, you're just gonna basically get little turning blanks at that point. So um, if, if you're doing this at home, I'd definitely encourage you to cut some thicker stuff. And the beauty with the thicker stuff not only is it gives you more options for building, but if you run out of whatever you need for a project, you can always resaw that thicker stock into something else. You'd be amazed at where you can dry lumber. Uh, I, I typically just try to get some place with a roof over it. Even if, if you're outside and don't have a roof over it, you could put a piece of plywood or tin or build a little, basically a shed roof that just drops right on top of your pile. Um, another trick I've seen outside is they'll use um, screen or mesh or even landscape fabric and go around the pile to kind of keep stuff from going in. They say a rule of thumb is for every inch of thickness, you need a year to dry the stuff. I've had stuff dry in as little as three months if the weather conditions are right. Uh, and what I mean by dry is get as, get, as, uh, get as much moisture out of the board as you're going to get in that environment. So even with this stuff, we have to bring it into uh, the building to then get it down to the 6 to 8 percent that we need to make furniture out of if you would. And I've had situations where I've set up a pile in a building that I know has great air movement 
and the thing starts molding on me. So if you've never done this before, one thing you want to check uh, right off the bat after even a few weeks, a couple months, is go in and look at the, the pile and see if you have any mold going. A lot of times it'll start around the stickers, and um, what'll happen is you'll get, first thing you'll get is called sticker stain, where uh, you'll get stripes across your boards wherever your stickers were because they have moisture trapped in it. And uh, as far as checking moisture, I forgot to bring my moisture meter. I have two kinds. One is a pinned and one is a pinless. I keep the pinless in the shop because by the time it gets to the shop, the boards are exposed and I can put it on the face. Um, with how the, the pinless meter reads, if you're trying to read the side of a board or even the end of a board, it doesn't give you the best reading possible. A pinned meter when you're in a pile like this is great because you can actually go in and, and jab it in the wood um, and read the, the edge of a board more accurately. Uh, the, the pinless ones really like smooth wood and they like to be in full contact to, to get a good number, but that's how I, you know, for years you kind of guesstimate and you go, ah, it feels dry, but after you get a moisture meter, you can't go back. It's just, it's really nice just to know exactly what you're dealing with before you start building. So I, did, I didn't talk so much about it down there, but this is what's underneath my stack down there. And this is the way I like to go about starting a stack or engineering a stack, getting a good foundation under it. Um, what I typically do is, uh, the, the hardest part is leveling up these two beams. So I find where my high side is, which I thought was this guy, set that corner, basically put a level on this, pick up this until I get it to level, take my measurement for what this block is gonna be. And these blocks are just cutoffs of these guys. So it is end grain there. Put that on there, uh, get this one leveled and start putting my bearings on. Typically, if you see very uh, well-run sawmills, they're gonna put these stickers they're gonna get these stickers 12 to 18 inches apart. If you start stacking lumber, you will find out very quickly you don't have enough of these if you had all of these in the world. You just never have enough stickers. I've made fun of constantly because I'm up in the shop and if there's a strip of wood, I'll make a sticker out of it. <laughs> I'm just always trying to make more stickers. You never have enough. Um, so the way we have this stack today, we have about 20 inches between stickers. I've gone 24. Um, I've gone up to 30, but then you get more kind of sagging between your stickers. So we're going to start with our longest logs first. Uh, I'm to the point I just, I have my specific lengths and I have my piles and they go straight to the pile. You might end up having stuff all different lengths. So our first stuff is eight feet long, so that's why we need the, the six bearings. And you might notice these two are a little bit closer. After we get done with those two first logs, then it drops down to about 82 inches, and that's what then these five are spaced for. So our first stack is gonna go all the way to here. We're gonna get several layers, and then we're gonna drop that and, and move down. Our last logs are, I think we got a five and a six and a half. We'll have to play with that. Then it drops down to just these guys. You can weave in, like if you had one short board or two, you could weave it in, in somewhere in the middle, but um, you, you want to kind of be a little bit neurotic about keeping everything. The, the more uniform you can be, the better results you're going to have in the long run. My stickers, I'm usually, I'll pass this around. Don't poke an eye out. Um, I'm just cutting uh, white oak, mostly for my stickers. You typically want to get a hardwood, and um, I've had okay luck with red oak, but you get a little bit more staining than you do with the white oak. So, <laughs> yes, I have a whole pile of white oak stickers. It sounds expensive, but wood grows on trees. Another thing I'll do, this is a laminated sticker, where uh, if I have old stickers that have gone bad, uh, I can start laminating them together or taking thinner pieces of wood and stacking them together. And I've had really good luck with that because I glue that up with Type Bond 3, which is an outdoor wood. And once you get those together, it, it's kind of like plywood. It no longer acts like wood where it wants to bow and crack and even soak up moisture. It's, it's a lot stronger sticker. So uh, I have a few stickers today we did out of maple um, just because I was trying to come up with a few more. Um, a lot of times what you're going to do is take a, a stack apart and then put a new stack in, but I had to come up with new stickers today. This is a bandsaw mill. 
Uh, the blade on this is 176 inches. Knock on wood, I've never had one break. I've done a lot of stupid things, but I've never had one break. But if you hear a loud pop, it may benefit you to back away. <laughs> the, the times I have, we've, uh, uh, Daniel, our ad sales guy, he comes in the shop and likes to break bandsaw blades. Um, usually it's just a loud pop and the blade stays in the, in the, uh, the safety shield, so uh, you're good there. But just, just forewarning. We have uh, a water jug up here. So this is gonna run down, and uh, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's not that you're keeping the blade cool, you're keeping a little bit of lubrication on that. Uh, this especially gets into when, if you're cutting softwoods and it gets pitchy, you can get different additives to put in that to keep pitch off the blade, and I'm sure you've run into that in your own lives where the gullets of your saw blade, whatever it is, fill up with pitch, and you're just trying to keep it lubricated to, to keep that moving through. This one is awful nice because they've added a check valve here, so if you want to come up and look at it, this is about how much water I run at a time. So if it's coming down like a flood, it's way too much. All you need basically is a little trickle, and you, you see it trickles right there. Uh, if I'm edging, like if, if I have just like a board on edge and I want to just remove a little, I might not turn it on. Um, on the old mills, you actually had to manually turn it on up there, so you had to come over and do it. But now they've made it so easy right here that you don't have an excuse. <laughs> so um, for, for little stuff, you can probably get away with it, but I, I just like to, to do it. Uh, the only thing I would do in the winter is if it's bitterly cold, uh, we will throw a little antifreeze in it just to keep, because it isn't that this freezes up, it's, it freezes up right in here where the water pools. So you have to keep something to, to keep it moving. Back to the blades, you can get blades of all kinds of different pitch angles and uh, cutting. Uh, what am I trying to say? How, you, you can buy a blade based on the wood that you're going to cut. So uh, if you want to cut softwoods, you can get a softwood blade, hardwoods, hardwood blade. They have blades for um, uh, frozen woods, for uh, uh, blade recommendations for like uh, if you're doing reclaimed lumber. Some of the, uh, the, the bigger mills have uh, guide bearings on them. So if they're, they're sawing uh, reclaimed beams and running it into a lot of nails, they can keep the blade even as, after it's hit a couple nails, centered on the, your cut so you can go through it. This will go through, this will go right through nails. And I don't know that we're gonna hit any today. You hit all kinds of crazy stuff when you're, you're cutting lumber. But um, these can also be resharpened. So just because you hit something doesn't mean the blade is ruined. You can send it back in and get it resharpened. And you know, I, I've always put the pricing at about 20 bucks a blade. So really, it's not that expensive, because if you think about it, it's really big teeth. It's not like our little bandsaw blades where it's six to 12 teeth an inch. It's barely a, a tooth an inch or a tooth every inch and a half. So uh, simpler to manufacture, obviously, you know, uh, a little cheaper to buy and, and we can get that fixed too. So that is kind of this end. This is just the gas. Uh, this over here is the blade tension. So if we want to get the blade out, uh, you, loosen it right there. We got a 25 horse motor on this. Uh, you can run it on all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, electric motors, gas motors, diesel motors. Um, and uh, this particular mill is all manual. So it's all manual, you have to do all the work, but the nice thing is you don't have to maintain any hydraulics or electrics. So to run this forward, you can do one of two things. You can just push this forward and it'll go. We also have a, a, a spool here. So do you see this little lever right here? You grab that, squeeze it, and you can drive the head forward and you can pull it back. It's got a, a bar on it so you can push. And then this wheel is for adjusting the head. So we have a scale right here. Notice when I get down to yellow right here. What the yellow tells me is if I have these up, I'm going to saw into them. 
So that's kind of my danger warning of, of what's going on there. Uh, my recommendation would be if you buy a brand new mill, just set those up and saw into them. Get it over with. You're going to do it. You know, you don't have to saw it off. Just hit it. Cut a little bit. Get your blade dulled. Hit it. Get it over with. You know, it's, it's like scratching a new car. So it, it's going to happen, but uh, it's, it's a warning. So that's, I'd have those up when I start the log. Um, this has... Uh, a screw log dog. So basically we're going to trap the log between these guys and this until we get it down to cant and then we can fold these down and, and use these little uh, dogs right there to hold it. So should we get going? Really those the side dogs are for when the log is still round and so it's, it's big enough that you need to hold it. Once I have it down to a square then these fold down. And then it would grab right here. So as long as I do, as long as I'm over an inch, I don't saw those off. Um, I have sawn, I've sawn veneer on these where, you know, I had a big board and I wanted 16th inch veneer. So I glued it down to a substrate, clamped the substrate on there put this on and just started sawing veneer off. It's beautiful, you don't have to push, you just saw it right off. <laughs> so with a, you can have all kinds of fun with this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab that first log there that the reason we cut it off is I wanted it at eight feet rather than nine, so it matches up to the one after it. And I'm just gonna set it right here on the ramps. We're gonna roll that up, show you how to hold it, and then we'll start cutting. Oh, first thing before we get it, what don't I have up on the back side? I don't have my stops. So if he rolls it, it just rolls right off the back. You'll never do that either. These have to come out on this particular mill because otherwise they prevent the, the head from going down. We have a little bit of a crook in this, don't we, even after I cut it off. Um, so I'm standing back looking at this going, it's pretty darn level, um, but I think we can rotate it 90 degrees, get it on its side, and, uh, and see if it's a little flatter. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Um, so I need to know where I'm starting on and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll use the mill to measure. So I could come over here and go, okay this is a 14 inch log and then try to figure out how tall it is here. But I have a built in scale on my mill. So what I do a lot of times is just bring the mill up and then drop the head on the high spots. So right there, I'm at 15 and a half. Oh, we still got that running. Down here, we're at 15 and just under a half, and this looks a little taller right here. Well, no, it actually isn't. It looks like it goes up, but that's 15 and a half as well. So anything under 15, I'm gonna take bark off of. That's also good for me because I'm not down in my yellow area. So what I'm actually gonna do, if we want four quarter, I'm gonna bring this scale out.
dollars. So right now what I'm thinking is on this particular log, this is a beautiful face, hopefully the other side looks good, these will be our boards. So the, the next flip will be to get a, a relatively straight edge, and then the other side will be just to get the bark off, and then when we flip it one more time, it'll be to get another straight edge. Uh, so the other thing uh, with stacking, you want to get the, the sawdust off this as much as possible. Not only to see what's going on, but if you mix sawdust in the stack, it's just a place for mold to get started. But typically when I'm doing this, uh, I like to have a helper on this end, and as, as the minute I'm done with that board, this is pulled off, so your off pile is usually I throw my junk here, my good boards come off the back, the good stuff comes on the front. If you're setting this up, you probably want the wind to your back. So uh, I'd, I'd like to have prevailing wind go this way. If I can't get that, I want it going this way. And I, it, it sucks when it's in your face because all the dust just comes right back at you. So um, yeah, let's flip this thing. Now the other thing you might notice, before you loosen that, I better get this back. If I let the blade come to a complete stop, I don't raise the head and I can slide it back and a lot of times I can use the blade to scrape off some of that sawdust. Uh, starting out, it's, it's, it's probably good to just shut it down, bring it back, you know, don't get crazy. Once you get used to it, one thing I'll do is I'll get down to the end, raise it an inch, just leave the machine running, pull it back and hit the next cut. But that's if you have help too. If you have help pulling logs, that's kind of nice. So. Uh, one more thing, uh, just administrative, really big logs. So this is a wider head. Now, Alex, come like you're going to turn this. What's the first thing he's going to do? Stick a leg in here. Why don't you want to stick a leg in there? <laughs> That's, I've, I, you, you get into that situation, you get back and you don't have enough leverage, so you stick a leg inside and you're like, oh, I'm going to roll it, and then it slips, and you're like, oh... I, I'm going to be here a while. <laughs> and the chainsaw's down there. I can't even get out. So it's, it's uh, on small logs, you can get away with it. But big stuff, you can get into trouble. OK, so we're going to loosen this. OK, we're golden. I got it. Hey, what are you doing in there? Danger zone. Danger zone. All right. Uh, let's figure out what our setting is going to be on this. So again, I, I'm just going to use the the mill to measure. Because I know my high spot. Okay, it's right in there. So we'll dump this down. Let's start right there, just for fun. This blade guide, you, you try to keep it as close to the log as possible. Obviously, you don't want to run it out here except for a big log. But right in here, the only problem I have is sometimes this catches, so we're going to set it about right there. So when we get narrow logs, you'll see me pull it all the way in just to try to give that blade as much support as possible. The only thing when you're operating it that you don't see is if you hit something or if you get a dull blade and the blade starts making waves, it's hard to pick that up as the operator. So it's good to have someone standing back because if all of a sudden you hit something and the blade dips down, they can go, whoa, 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 turn it off. Uh, still in the round, so before we loosen that, we're going to get the cant hook on it so we can actually hold it. Now we're to the point, because I know when I was cutting it before, uh, on the other side I was down to like 12 inches, and I know my, my yellow zone is at 10. So these log supports in the back, I'm not going to set up full height anymore. What I'm going to do is actually fold them down halfway. Yeah, that's, it's just sticky. So now they should be out of the way for when we cut, but they're still supporting it.
I think the other side is pretty, but that looks a lot better on the inside than it did on the outside, didn't it? <laughs> um, I'm going to save this board again. This has one straighter edge, but we're going to have to edge that to, to get the bark off it to make it look good. So we basically have, we're going to flip this up. I know my corners are high, so those will have to get lopped off first. But So right now we're going to make a straight edge, just get the rest of that bark over. After that, one more turn, and then we're just going to start making boards. I do want to mention before we turn this, these uh, log supports on the back, we halfway folded down. So you can go about this two ways. If you want to just roll it right now with a cant hook, you need to get those back vertical. Because folded down like that, it'll just roll right off the back on you. And that's the worst thing ever. Another trick is right now we can pull this and just slide it because it's on a flat face. And now that it's on a flat face, then you can just stack it right into place. So it's, uh, we're to the point now, we don't even need these on the back, but I'm going to set them up a little bit anyway, just because sometimes you get a narrow piece like that, and if you have everything low, the blade is pulling that way, it can go like this on you halfway through the cut. All right, let's, are you happy with that or do you want no bark on it? Okay, because we're going to have, so again, we're going to flip this down on its face and so we have 11 and a half inch boards and that'll work out because my, my stack, my stickers are 36, so we'll get three across on the bottom for this. So now just cutting this through and through, the outside boards will be flat sawn, but then when we get to the middle, those will be quarter sawn boards. So as I do these two eight foot logs and we work it into the stack, I want to segregate out the flat sawn that'll come from the outside. And then as we get to the middle where that end grain goes vertical, we'll want those boards together. But your best for grade is just continuing to spin this. So right now, well, let's see what this looks like. If I'm trying to make money off this, well, that doesn't look awful, but um, so if I took two, three more boards off this, they aren't full boards because they have bark on them. So probably my best bet would be to get to this face, saw a few boards off that, like you said, get it to the other side, saw that off, and then I'm down past this bark. I might be only four inches wide, get it up on edge and start going there. Um, another thing I do... My joiner is eight inches wide. My boards are seven and a half inches wide. <laughs> uh, people will tell you, I got a 15 inch planer, I want 15 inch boards, and they do that once. And then <laughs> everything else, seven inches, uh, you know, because that's what their joiner probably is. So um, wide boards are really cool and you need them, but for the wide variety of stuff that you get, uh, narrow and long, it works really nice. <laughs> Okay, so we got these folded all the way down. Uh, I'm going to put on, oh yeah, I can. This has a little, uh, it does two things. So I can use the spike on the end if I'm having a hard time grabbing the log. But then I have this little dovetail cut in there. So I can set that in. And this is how I can grab the front end of the log, but keep this down far enough that I don't get it into the blade. So on this particular one, again, we're not going to try to get every single perfect board out of it. We're going to just saw it through and through kind of in a bool. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I pick through a pile and find sequential boards that I can book match, I get a little excited. So that's what we're going to give Alex here. Yeah? All right. You know, um, for uh, cutting speed, the nice thing with the manual mill is you, you get that feedback of cranking. 
And you might have noticed with him, now that we're, we're past the bark and we're into full width cuts, it's not just breezing right along. It, there's a, just a little bit more resistance there. I just wanted to mention one more administrative thing about cutting um, is uh, you probably saw me setting the height of the mill. So the scale on that is straight in inches. So if I set it on one inch, two inch, three inch, that's where the blade will be. But that doesn't include kerf loss, which is maybe an eighth of an inch. So if I set it on one inch, I, uh, I'm actually getting seven eighths of an inch board. So what this magnetic strip does is I can put it right next to the scale and it includes kerf loss. So on the four, it would be four quarters, which would be one inch, but it's including that. So if I measured this, it'd actually be about an inch and an eighth. And then it gives me five quarter, which would be inch and a quarter, six quarter, inch and a half, eight quarter, which would be two inches. But again, it includes that kerf loss. Another thing I'll do often is if I'm not using the scale, I'll just do it in my head. So one thing I do is I, I cut a little more than an inch. So I set the scale at inch and a quarter, which means I'm getting eight inch and eighth boards. So I just go inch and a quarter, two, three and three quarters, five, all the way up. And what that gives me then is I can work in increments of fives. So a lot of times it's, it's getting used to the mill. Starting out, I would stick with just work with numbers and try to get what you can. But then after a while, you, you get used to what works for you and what you want for your, for your woodworking. And you can start doing those increments of, of numbers. When you cut a board, part of how it warps as well, you've never seen a warped board before, have you? They don't exist. What's, what's going on is, you know, the, the tree has annual growth rings, so it's putting on a little bit more weight every year. Uh, and when you cut that into a board, those round growth rings try to lay flat, if that makes sense. So when I am stacking, I try to put the inside of the tree up. I know these boards are going to cup, so what I want to do is I want to get them in the orientation. So if they're going to cup, they're going to cup like this, because if I put pressure right down in the middle, they're going to lay flat. If they cup like this, I have a harder time putting pressure on the corners and getting them to push down. So yeah, let's bring that one over, and can I get this end over on this side so they can see? Hopefully this is a little thicker on that end, isn't it? So. What were you guys doing? Okay, so first, first layer, we don't want that one in there. What we're gonna have to do is take them back to the mill, reset it on one, and, and cut it again. But so I'm looking at the end grain here, and so this is, it, this is more of a flat saw board. Over here you have some rift, here you have some rift. But what I'm trying to do, because these, right in here, this is where it's gonna cup on me. What these are gonna try to do is they're gonna try to lay flat. And when they lay flat, they're gonna bring these corners up. So again, it's, I wanna put that inside of the tree, which should be there if I'm thinking about this right. Yeah, I wanna bring the inside of the tree up because that'll make this board cup like that. I get weight on it through the stickers and I can press on it right there. Uh, also, this board, I think this was right off this, wasn't it? So that has, it's not quite from the middle of the tree because the tree was crooked. It's not quite the outside of the tree. So this is kind of one of those, I'm in between. What I'd probably do on this first layer, we don't want this guy. He needs to get trimmed up. So you can get rid of that. I kind of like this. This is, he's gonna quit on me too. Uh, <laughs> so what I'd probably do is get two good outside boards. Get me two good outside boards. And uh, put this guy in the middle. What I typically do is, if, if the numbers work right, I, I can pack them right close. The, at minimum, what I want to do is get these two outsides flush with the outside and then just let the middle do what it is. If it is tight all the way across, that's where the mice will live. Um, this at least gives them a place to come down. Um, so it's, it's uh, the width of your stack and then what you cut your boards to. So if I, if I cut these to 10 inch, I could just barely squeeze four across and maximize it. 
And that's, that's what usually gets you, is that, that actually kind of is a good point. If, if I'm wasting space here, and I have a finite number of stickers, and I have a finite height of how high I can take this, uh, you're losing capacity here. You could weave in, if you had a four inch board, you could weave that in right there. Um, but we aren't there quite yet. These aren't the perfect examples, but this gets me started. And, and you can kind of see this stuff wiggles around until you get some weight on it. What I'd want to do next is get this cleaned off. You'd, you really don't want sawdust where your sticker hits, but try to get these stickers perfectly spaced right on these, get the next layer on without disturbing it, and just work my way up. And, uh, and then you wait. It's like a savings account. You just wait. If you do end up getting a mill, I will warn you, you're going to have piles like this everywhere, just, just to tell you. Uh, the other thing I will warn you is um, you'll very soon figure out that uh, wood grows on trees, and people will just start bringing you trees. <laughs>